Hi, I'm Conan Matharson, and in this screencast, we're going to recap uh, Wolf Parkinson White and associated arrhythmias. This can be a challenging concept to grasp, but we'll walk you through it here. Let's first recap normal cardiac conduction. I have a little EKG graph paper over here. The sinus node fires, but that's essentially electrocardiographically silent. The atria depolarize, leading to the P wave. The AV node depolarizes, and that's electrocardiographically silent, so there's the PR interval that's inscribed on the EKG tracing. Then the ventricles depolarize rapidly down the his Purkinje system and bundle branches, leading to a sharp QRS complex. And then the atria depolarize, which are a electrocardiographically silent event, and eventually the ventricles depolarize, leading to a T wave, or rather, uh, repolarize, leading to a T wave. So now let's see what happens when you add in an accessory pathway. And here's where uh, it's important to start keeping track of the nomenclature because the words are used somewhat loosely clinically, but it's important to know uh, what we're referring to when we say specific things. So let's draw an accessory pathway here. And it can be anywhere in the heart. We've just drawn it on the right side, on the right ventricle, connecting to the right atrium. But you could have an accessory pathway posteriorly or laterally on the other side of the left, left uh, ventricle and left atrium. So we draw an accessory pathway here in orange, and this is an, it's important to note that this is an anatomic structure, and what it is is basically a band of muscle connecting the atria and the ventricles. Uh, the correct terms for this anatomic structure are accessory pathway, it's also known as a Kent bundle or bundle of Kent, or a bypass tract. So it's important to note that this anatomic structure is not called a WPW or Wolf-Parkinson-White, that's, that's a manifestation of this structure, as we'll see in a moment. So you have an accessory pathway, and I think the other important thing to recall before moving on is just to remember um, sort of the order of the speed of conduction of various tissues. So recall that the his Purkinje system conducts very, very rapidly. Ventricular myocardium or atrial myocardium uh, conducts less rapidly, and since the his Purkinje, or rather the accessory pathway is similar to atrial or ventral, ventricular myocardium, it conducts just about as rapidly. And slowest of all is the AV node, and of course the SA node. Their job is to slow conduction. So the AV node is slower in conducting than the accessory pathway. Okay, so now let's step through the electrocardiogram and shown here ghosted in gray is the normal EKG that we saw on the previous beat in the uh, heart without an accessory pathway. So again, the SA node depolarizes the atrium depolarizes. And now let's just pause here and kind of consider where we're at with the atrial wavefront. So you can see the atrium is uh, depolarized and it's ready to try to depolarize the atrioventricular node. And the atrium is depolarized and it's also ready to try to depolarize the accessory pathway. So remember that the AV node conducts slowly and the accessory pathway conducts pretty quickly, although not as quickly as the his Purkinje system. So let's just step forward a tiny bit in this EKG tracing. So each little box is 0 0.04 seconds. Let's just step forward, uh, say, 0 0.02 seconds. And what you see here is that the AV node has partially depolarized. That is to say the atrial wavefront has propagated partially into the AV node, but it's still got a ways to go. And the bypass tract has pretty much fully depolarized and it's ready to depolarize the ventricle. So, and this is right where we're at for the EKG tracing. We've made it about, I guess, 0 0.03 seconds into the EKG. So that's where we're at. And now let's see what happens uh, just a little bit further into the electrocardiogram. So now what's happened is uh, we've progressed, let's say, 0 0.03 seconds, or actually 0 0.04 seconds. And the AV node has now fully depolarized. <laughs> And the uh, bypass tract has uh, hit the ventricle and has depolarized a part of the ventricle. But it hasn't gone really far, but it has depolarized a good chunk of the myocardium. And so since it depolarized a good chunk of the myocardium, you see a deflection in the electrocardiogram because the amount of myocardium that was depolarized is sufficient to make an impact on the surface recording. So you see this uh, upstroke here, and it's slurred and it's slow. 
And this is called a delta wave, and that's from the pre-excited ventricle. And note that because the conduction through the ventricle, through slow, slowish channels like gap chunk consistent, et cetera, uh, is occurring without the benefit of the his purkinje system or bundle branch, the upstroke is slower. So it's sort of slurred, and that's why people call this sort of a slurred upstroke too. And this is what a delta wave is. So by the time the AV node has fully depolarized and is ready to finally conduct down the his purkinje system into the ventricles, the uh, bypass tract has had a little bit of a jump start and has depolarized part of the ventricle. So from here on in, uh, it's it's not really a fair fight in that the AV node gets to take a take benefit of the his purkinje system, but the uh, bypass tract really has to continue depolarizing slowly through the ventricle. So the remainder of the EKG, once the AV node is ready to conduct, really looks pretty similar to the previous QRS complex. And you can see here what I've drawn is the amount of ventricle depolarized by the AV node, and maybe a little bit extra got depolarized by the uh, pre-excited uh, portion that had been originally conducted through the delta wave, or rather the accessory pathway, but not much more. So this is how you get a delta wave when you have an accessory pathway. So let's look at some of the consequences of this delta wave in terms of intervals on the, the electrocardiographic tracing. So if you look at the uh, gray tracing, we can see that the original PR interval was one, two, three, four little boxes, or 0.16 seconds. But because of the pre-excitation, because of the delta wave, the new PR interval is about one, two, two and a half little boxes, or 0.1 seconds. So we can see that the PR interval has shortened. The other consequence of this delta wave is that the QRS interval, or QRS complex duration, is lengthened, such that now, instead of about 0.06 seconds, it's 0.12 seconds. So these are sort of the classic findings with uh, a pre-excited pathway or an accessory pathway. And this is called WPW pattern. So it's important to call this WPW pattern uh, because this patient so far has just been in normal sinus rhythm, has never had an arrhythmia. Uh, they're not really having any symptoms from it. It's just something that you find on the electrocardiogram. And a lot of times patients come into the emergency room, say, for you know, a headache or something like that, they get an electrocardiogram and then cardiology gets called because of this pattern. And we say, uh, no big deal. So two things to note, not all patients with a bypass tract manifest WP w pattern on the EKG. So I showed you this sort of uh, classic example, but imagine if, for example, the bypass tract was on the other side on the left atrium, since the sinoatrial node starts up in the right atrium, it's possible that the bypass tract never activates a significant chunk of ventricle in order to create a delta wave inscribed on the electrocardiographic tracing. The other possibility is that uh, it doesn't conduct because it has some sort of unidirectional block or something like that. But suffice it to say, you don't always see this uh, even if the patient has a bypass tract. The second point to note is that not all patients with WPW pattern, again, develop an arrhythmia. So just because you have the pattern doesn't mean that you're doomed to have uh, an arrhythmia like AVRT. So that's sort of normal activation with WPW pattern on the EKG. So now let's look at something abnormal. Let's look at atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia, which is orthodromic, and we'll walk through this slowly here. So usually these arrhythmias initiate because of either a premature or pre premature atrial contraction or a premature ventricular con contraction. That's not really that important to know. Uh, but somehow, during that, because it's premature and isn't happening during the normal activation pattern, um, it when it activates the atrium, it's possible that it may encounter the accessory pathway uh, and find it to be refractory for whatever reason. And what I've drawn, done here is draw the electrocardiogram. I've drawn the P wave upside down just because it's an ectopic atrial focus or beat, and it it's likely to have a strange P wave morphology. So since the refractory, the accessory pathway is refractory, the um, conduction can only occur into the SA node, and then the ventricle is activated, inscribing a gen pretty much normal QRS complex.
but by the time the wavefront reaches this refractory period, I, reaches the accessory pathway, the refractoriness is lifted, so that uh, circle with the dash through it is gone, and the uh, electrocardiogram, the signal can propagate into the atrium, and what that does is it inscribes the retrograde P wave, which isn't always seen on the electrocardiogram because there's a lot of other things going on during this time, but you can sometimes get a retrograde P wave. And now uh, the AV node is again no longer refractory, so then you can have conduction down the his Purkinje system and then back up through the bypass tract in a reentrant arrhythmia called atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia. And the orthodromic means that it's going in the correct or right direction, that is to say, down the um, his Purkinje system. So drawn here is a tachycardia, and I illuminated the T waves so that you could kind of see the P waves. Um, and this is at a rate of about 150 beats a minute, so this patient would probably be symptomatic. So that's orthodromic AVRT. Now, a couple things to notice. One is uh, the delta wave is gone because the delta wave represents bypass tract conduction, and the bypass tract is conducting somewhere over here, so there's no delta wave. You see a narrow complex QRS, um, and you may see a retrograde P wave. Okay, now let's look at the other scenario, which is uh, antidromic AVRT. And the only difference here is that when that premature atrial contraction or premature ventricular contraction occurs, instead of finding the bypass tract to be refractory, it finds the AV node to be refractory. So that means after the atrium conducts, the initial depolarization occurs down the bypass tract, and you have slow conduction through the gap junctions, etc., and so you get a wide QRS complex. And so this wide QRS complex is drawn out here. And by the time this um, electrical activity reaches the AV node again, the AV node is no longer refractory and is able to conduct in a retrograde fashion, which, you may, which may result in seeing a retrograde P wave again on the electrocardiogram. And again, now the uh, bypass tract is ready to conduct again. So you can get a reentrant arrhythmia going up the his Purkinje system through the AV node into the atria and down the bypass tract and back into the ventricle and so on in an antidromic direction, that is to say, up the his Purkinje system instead of down it. And what you get here, uh, again, you see retrograde P waves, uh, but you also see a wide complex QRS because the conduction through the ventricle is occurring through uh, slower conducting pathways than the his Purkinje system. Okay, a third scenario to kind of add on is what happens if you have atrial fibrillation with an accessory pathway. So atrial fibrillation is a micro reentrant arrhythmia that occurs in the atria, and so the accessory pathway and the AV node are con constantly being bombarded by electrical signals. The AV node isn't able to conduct any faster than, let's just say, 150 beats a minute, but the accessory pathway being similar to ventricular myocardium can conduct relatively frequently. And so through the accessory pathway uh, at a relatively high frequency because the atrial fibrillation is so rapid and irregular, you get rapid uh, stimulation of the ventricles leading to a wide complex and irregular tachyarrhythmia, which is atrial fibrillation through an accessory pathway. So now you're ready to kind of understand what WPW syndrome is. And that is to say, it's whenever you have WPW pattern on the EKG, most classically manifested as a short PR interval and a long QRS duration, plus any one of these arrhythmias that is dependent upon accessory pathways. So orthodromic AVRT, antidromic AVRT, or AFib with an accessory pathway. So when you have that combination, an arrhythmia plus the underlying uh, EKG pattern in normal sinus rhythm, you have WPW syndrome. Now, one little caveat to that is that remember I said that not everyone with an accessory pathway manifests WPW pattern on their surface EKG. So truly, even if you don't see the WPW pattern on the resting EKG, but they have an arrhythmia which uh, can only occur through WP through a bypass tract then that's also WPW syndrome. So you might ask, well, how do you know what's happening through the bypass tract? Sometimes you, you said that you can't differentiate on the surface EKG AVNRT from AVRT. 
And sometimes it can be hard to differentiate AFib through an accessory pathway, potentially from ventricular tachycardia. And you're right. Uh, sometimes in order to make this diagnosis without the surface EKG pattern, you have to do an electrophysiologic study where the electrophysiologist puts catheters in the heart and directly measures uh, and looks for the bypass tract. So that's uh, WPW pattern, WPW syndrome, and three of the arrhythmias associated with it. Thank you very much.